everyone, and welcome to our interview series celebrating 200 years of Gregor Mendel. I'm Aastha Vatsyayan, a PhD student in Dr. Vinod Skarya's lab. And today we have with us Dr. Partha P. Majumdar, the National Science Chair, the Government of India. He's also the distinguished professor and founder of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, as well as the Emeritus Professor at Indian Statistical Institute and Honorary Professor at Indian Institute of Science, Ed Education and Research. Dr. Majumdar has made significant contributions to the fields of genetics of human disease, evolution, and population genomics using innovative statistical methods and paradigms. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, thank so you very you much, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you, sir. Uh, so you've made uh, several important interdisciplinary uh, contributions to the field of science in your remarkable career. Uh, could you briefly discuss with us what some of your current areas uh, of research interest are? So uh, um, I have been spending a lot of time trying to understand cancer in the last 10 years or so. Um, Concurrently, I've also been trying to understand what uh, I started with many, many, many years ago, uh, trying to understand evolution of humans, in particular, uh, evolution of humans in India, evolution and migration of humans in India. So uh, that, that work continues. On the side, as I do these kinds of work, I also work on development of uh, statistical methods because we are generating bigger and bigger data sets that all of which are not amenable to standard statistical methods, so they need to be looked at uh, using another set of tools or a different kind of thinking. Uh, so I've also been uh, involved in that. I, um, yeah, so this, this is what I have been doing in the last uh, 10 years or so. Very interesting, sir. Uh, so how would you say uh, Mendel's uh, discoveries have impacted your work so far? Uh, oh, well, Mendel made my life, uh, so uh, essentially so. So I'm uh, uh, deeply in debt to Mendel. Um, you know, when I started my career, uh, one of the things that uh, dawned on me, well, I started my career in statistics. I uh, um, formally am trained in statistics. I did my bachelor's and master's from the Indian Statistical Institute, went down to a PhD in biostatistics. So essentially my foundational uh, science is in statistics, training is in, is in statistics, but also the Indian Statistical Institute has played a major role in shaping the development of human genetics in India. Uh, that's, a, that's a long history, if you wish I can narrate, but that's a long history. So we were growing up in an atmosphere where, you know, human genetics was being cultivated. And very quickly, one of the things that I had learned is that uh, in order to be able to do uh, human genetics, uh, to understand how uh, transmission takes place from one generation to another, these are uh, these are actually governed by probabilistic laws, and probability is an integral part of statistics. So uh, I quickly realized that my foundational um, uh, training in statistics could be used in a major way in understanding biological problems of segregation and transmission uh, of characteristics from one generation to another. Uh, so, um, and, and obviously, uh, all of this could not have happened without uh, Gregor Mendel doing the kind of experiments that he did, um, using, uh, keeping, keeping meticulous notes of what he was observing and analyzing the data from a mathematical point of view. At that time, statistics was really not born, so he was using intuition and some of the mathematical training that he had uh, with Christian Doppler, the physicist, and, and others. So he was uh, using those kinds of principles in order to propound a set of laws that uh, governs uh, the kind of business that we do now. Uh, of course, genetics has, um, has sort of um, increased in, uh, or, or uh, expanded in a major way. Uh, the laws of Mendel are intrinsically valid but also have to be replenished with other kinds of thoughts uh, in order to understand uh, you know, propagation uh, of uh, characteristics from one generation to another. So it's been uh, very uh, exciting, but, but again, uh, without those principles that were laid out by Gregor Mendel, uh, we would never be able to conceptualize uh, the study of 
um, you know, human traits, either diseases or health or what have you, whatever you want uh, to study that, that you believe might be transmitted from one generation to another uh, without those. So he's had, a, of course, the most major influence on this. Right, sir. Uh, sir, uh, definitely as your work showcases for scientists, but uh, also for the common man, do you think it's important uh, for people to study genetics? Um, is it important to study genetics? Uh, if you're interested in questions of biology, and I will not you know, go to the whole of biology, if you're interested in studying, for example, uh, humans, uh, because we can relate ourselves uh, to humans the easiest, so if you're interested in understanding, you know, uh, the various kinds of characteristics that, that we display under different environmental conditions, uh, let's say under stress or uh, when we are angry or whatever. Uh, and if we can see, if we want to study whether these kinds of characteristics uh, move from one generation to another, get transmitted from parents to offspring, then of course genetics comes in a major way. Uh, from the time uh, Mendel studied the character that he studied, and as you know, that he studied uh, essentially seven characteristics in, in the peat land, and he was extremely lucky because, uh, again, I don't think he used any, any particular kind of prior knowledge in order to choose these characteristics, but uh, he was very lucky because now we know where the genes for those characteristics are located, and they're located on different chromosomes. If they're located on the same chromosome, while two of them are located on the same chromosome and the remaining are located on different chromosomes. So each one is sort of segregates independently of the other characteristic. So in some ways, uh, his uh, experiments were very well designed. Uh, his, his choice of characters were lucky and therefore the observations were not flattered. Uh, today, of course, uh, when we want to study syndromes, uh, these syndromes are impacted on by various kinds of environments in addition to genes and of course when we are looking at uh, the study of genes we are very focused on uh, on, on the genetic portion and uh, we consider the environmental portion as noise the signal to us uh, is genetic and the noise is uh, environmental but both signal and noise together determine the way that we are uh, you know studying so uh, it has become very complex but that has also made it that much more exciting because if it was uh, just straightforward, then Mendel had taught us everything. Then there is nothing much more to learn um, from uh, as, a, as matters of principle. But today we have, uh, you know, because of these environmental interactions, because the uh, uh, the genes for a character are not simply um, are not determined by a single locus, can be determined by interplay of alleles um, uh, at various loci. So those actually provide us with opportunities uh, of understanding complexity of inheritance of traits. This also uh, uh, you know, entices us or pushes us to developing new methods, uh, both of experimentation as also of analysis, uh, such that we can understand the complexity of inheritance of these traits. Uh, not that we have been able to understand all complex traits. We are getting there inch by inch, uh, but it's been very, very exciting. Right, sir. So do you think the knowledge of genetics would also help the common man uh, if more and more people took interest in genetics or if in general, uh, let's say healthcare policies were shaped in a way that facilitated a lot of what genetics uh, has taught us? Uh, do you think that knowledge would help the common man? Uh, so two, two, uh, there are two ways of looking at this. First of all, uh, we are not uncommon. We are also common men. Just that we have a little bit more knowledge about genetics. Yes, but the common man is also asking or is in awe with the same kind of things that we are in awe. Uh, you know, when you when when you find that in a flower bed, when you find uh, the same species of flower in three different colors, just as the common man will think, why is it three different colors and how does, you know, uh, the next generation or the progeny will get what kind of color will the flowers we of, uh, so they, they are very interested in those kinds of questions, just as we are. Uh, if, if we talk them genetics, even rudimentary genetics, there will be, there will be a greater appreciation of the uh, kind of questions they're asking. Uh, I suppose what you are asking is that did the knowledge of genetics benefit the common man in a more applied way? 
Uh, for example, are we able to manage their health better? Are we able to treat them better? Are we able to discover more drugs with the knowledge of the genetics? But the answer to all of this is yes. And uh, to be, of course, uh, the, the common man, especially those, uh, those people who have a little bit more um, understanding of human biology, understanding of uh, you know, diseases, etc., uh, they, of course, uh, appreciate the fact that when a relative comes down with cancer and if they go to a cancer hospital, for example, the uh, cancer clinician will ask them to undergo some tests. And some of these tests are actually genetic tests and they know that these are genetic tests. And the reason why uh, those kinds of genetic tests are done is because the kind of drug that the doctor is going to prescribe to them depends on the kind of genetic endowment that they have. Now, this genetic endowment not, not necessarily will get transmitted from one generation to another, but in the cellular uh, you know, component, what kind of genetic endowment do they have or genetic composition do they have? So the uh, treatment is actually tied to the to the um, to the, to the uh, you know background um, DNA variation that there is in the in the cellular compartment that one is looking at. So yes, uh, that that's helpful. Even in terms of transmission, uh, given that we are we understand uh, you know genetic basis of the details much better, including of inborn errors of metabolism. We are able to predict even in an unborn child using certain kinds of technologies that are called amniotic synthesis and so on and so forth. We are able to understand whether an unborn child who may have a higher risk will actually does actually have the disease. So we are actually able to understand uh, the the, uh, the characteristics in the fetus. Uh, which the fetus will display after being born, even before the um, child is born. So, and, and this is only doable because of uh, improvements in understanding of genetics and also improvements in technology. So both of these combined uh, have uh, provided us with a lot of arsenal to be able to make ourselves useful to the common man, uh, not, not just in terms of understanding, but also in terms of their day-to-day -day life. Uh, Life. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. So, like you said, pre precision uh, oncology is one direct application of genetics. Newborn screening programs or even otherwise screening is absolutely essential. So, absolutely, sure. I think uh, the common man will benefit. So, what do you think is the next step with respect to genetics? What is the next step that we as researcher, researchers should take uh, with respect to genetics in our work? The next step uh, so far, uh, genes have or genetics has provided an uh, understanding and uh, has provided uh, mostly prediction, understanding and using that understanding to provide uh, predictive, to gain, provide us with uh, a lot of ability to predict uh, uh, even before the outcome. Uh, what we really need to do is to be able to use this knowledge that we have gathered over in the last century or so, uh, in, a, in a systematic, meaningful way, uh, to make it more actionable, in the sense that you know, how would you actually treat diseases as opposed to predict the outcome of the genetic endowment? Can be so. These these things are coming coming out a little bit, uh, or or uh, have started a little bit. But one needs to understand the cellular architecture. One needs to understand the cellular microenvironment. Uh, because uh, a cell with certain kinds of uh, genetic architecture may not behave in the same way in the different tissues. We need to understand this better. Uh, we need to understand the cellular program, cellular, uh, um, you know, the, the milieu in which uh, a cell with a particular um, uh, genetic defect um, arises or has arisen or decides. Uh, how will that impact on the life of that individual in terms of disease or health? Those are the kinds. So these, these understanding at this level, at the cellular level, will also enable us to become to make our knowledge more actionable. So the next phase of um, human genetics, and I'm only talking about human genetics because that's what I understand best, and that's what I've been uh, doing for all of my life. So my examples are all human, uh, or based on on human uh, understanding, human sciences. So uh, the next phase of human genetics will primarily be 
to take this understanding of genetics and make it more actionable. Uh, there are two major international projects that are currently, um, one's currently, uh, one's ongoing and the other is about to be initiated. One's called the uh, Human Cell Atlas Project, which essentially means that you look at the single cell, uh, each single cells sample from different parts of your body and ask the question, are these cells expressing the same thing a set of genes, uh, not all genes are expressed in every cell at every point of time. What are the um, uh, cells that are expressing uh, which subsets of genes and uh, in different, that are distributed in different uh, tissues of the body, also at different times, time points during uh, one's life. So both temporal and spatial organization at, at the single cell level and what genes uh, is it expressing. And we wish to tie that up. So this is really like building the atlas. It's called the Human Cell Atlas Project. Um, and this is this is uh, right now we are all uh, constructing this atlas based on a normal um, individuals or, uh, or cell samples from normal individuals. Uh, very soon we will also embark on um, cell samples from individuals with uh, specific diseases. Actually, that has already started, but again in a more concerted way, it will start shortly. So that's one. The other is called the International Common Disease Alliance, where uh, we are trying to take this information at the single cell level, but not just restrict ourselves to the single cell, but also look at various other components, uh, cellular and molecular biological components, in order to understand uh, the disease better, such that this information becomes more actionable in terms of treatment, in terms of amelioration of the disease condition, etc. And this is very important primarily because um, genes don't work uh, in, in solitude. Uh, it works in the context of an environment and they don't work independent of other genes. And therefore, this kind of um, you know, information is absolutely required in order for us to be able to, um, to, be able to uh, eat uh, into management of various management into the treatment of various kinds of things. So that will be the next. Phase or that is uh, the next phase has already started and that is going to occupy us for at least one decade. Wow, so exciting times ahead for sir, researchers uh, working in this. Uh, sir, uh, over the years, you've also taught a lot of students. So, uh, my last question to you today would be what is it, uh, any take home message or any any words of inspiration that you would like to say to the students who are just starting out now with their PhD journeys? How can, how, what should they focus on? How can their science benefit uh, humankind in general? Any, any, any advice, any words from your side, sir? Well, I, I don't want to be very preachy. Uh, two or three take home messages that I've taken in my own life. And I think those, uh, will, those, those still have stood the test of time and will uh, stand the test of time for many, many years to come. And that is, uh, even if you're doing biology, we have to have a quantitative bend of mind. Uh, we, uh, if you look at the history of biology, uh, it, it was primarily observational, but then Mendel showed us how to count and how to analyze that data in a more quantitative fashion. And most importantly, how to design experiments. So, um, uh, you know, this, this quantitative thinking in biology is uh, of paramount importance. The second is that if you are uh, initiating a particular kind uh, and you have certain questions in your mind, you should ask, why are we asking these questions? Sort of questioning the questions themselves. Um, uh, oftentimes we ask questions without uh, realizing or without asking ourselves, supposing I get answers to these questions, how will it benefit human life? Right. So, it's that that's uh, it has become very crucial. Questioning the questions has become very crucial. So I would say uh, quantification, questioning the questions, and be completely immersed in what you're doing. Don't do it superficially. If you're won't do it superficially, that means you're really not seeking the uh, not interested in seeking the answer to the question. Immerse yourself, and automatically you will see that you are you cannot solve the problem yourself. You have to embrace others who have other kinds of expertise, and therefore it automatically becomes a, a transdisciplinary approach to problem solving. So that those are the three things that I do. 
Right, sir. So interdisciplinary is the way to go, as as your remarkable career clearly showcases. Uh, thank you for making time for us, sir. Today it was really interesting talking to you, and thank you for those really uh, you know gems that you shared with us for our uh, fellow students, anyone else who's watching. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much for the pleasure. Thank you, sir.